All right. Well, uh, Doug, thank you for coming down here. We've we've enjoyed the time, but uh, we were uh, kicking around that it's been almost ten years since uh, Body by Science. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know your, your kids are growing up. Your uh, the world's changed a little bit. I'm sure. Um, but uh, but in seriousness, I mean, what you know, you set off to write Body by Science. So I guess kind of talk us through some of those motivations and what you saw then what you see now and kind of, you know, wh where the state of the state is, uh, I guess, kind of get, get to that, so. Yeah, I mean, John Little had kind of talked me into doing it. He called to ask a question, and I can't even remember what it was about, but it kind of went down a phone conversation that was sort of like the 21 convention biochemistry yeah. talk. Yeah. Right. And he's like, wow, shit, we gotta write a book, you know? And he had these connections with McGraw-Hill. Um, so we just kind of bounced it back and forth, but, um, so my motivations then were one was like, holy cow, I can like get a real actual book deal and I'll be a millionaire and I'll... <laughs> but the You're actual motivation happen, for the book yeah. was all this kind of transpired at a time where there was just starting to accumulate some literature um, on the high intensity side of exercise that was bearing out that everything that we all had been saying along the way was in, in fact, actually correct. So there was actually some solid literature and I knew from running a facility that you were, you know, swimming against the tide yep. really, really hard. And my motivation for it more than anything was to create um, at least some sort of research where someone resource where someone could point to and say, look, there is legitimacy to what I do. There is something that backs me up here. And it's not just this book but the book is footnoted with the literature that supports that, yes, this is a way to do this mm -hmm. in a way that works and makes sense. So my real motivation was for myself as a facility owner and for you know, people running shops across the country to have something to at least back them up because probably the most fatigue-inducing thing, at least at that time, of running a shop was just answering all the objections mm -hmm. over and over again. So yeah. just having something to kind of point to for that purpose was kind of the real motivation for it. Yeah, yeah. Chapter two uh, <laughs> has been a consistent, you know, with our EE stuff over the years, but just pointing people, okay, if you're not going to read the whole book, just just right. kind of understand the, the concepts yeah, yeah. Of, yeah. Of, of that. Um, so um, were there any changes you were like, okay, <laughs> a millionaire, maybe that didn't happen, I don't know. Yeah, no, but, no. But, 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 did, <laughs> but any other changes you're like, I really thought this would happen, but... Sure enough, no, uh, we're stuck. Or uh, what do you know. change? You mean changes Just, that I would change the book now in terms of? Yeah, I mean that 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 wasn't where I was going, but but possibly like, are there any changes or additions to the book? But I was also just kind of talking globally about let's just call it the exercise market or uh, marketplace that you really thought would happen. Uh, like, but we're going to write this part of this book to answer this question, and then maybe ten years later, you're like, shit, still not. We didn't nail uh, well, it, or we didn't get it, or it's, it's the perception from the public hasn't been what you wanted it to be. Well, yeah, I mean, part of, you know, everything's moving forward along the same time continuum, and what moved forward along with, you know, the book, which has had an amazing staying power, which I didn't really think it would. I thought it'd be like one or two years, and it's going to be dead, and, hmm. but it really, it sells as strong on a day-by-day -day basis now as it did in the first two years, which is wow, kind of weird. Yeah, yeah. Um, but things that changed along with that moving forward over that decade were um, kind of the CrossFit movement kind of flourished and blew up along then, but also kind of um, almost an, a return to the primitive in regards to exercise. So mm -hmm. in, in the earlier days, it was sort of always this argument between, you know, machines versus free weights, you know, but now it's like, even free weights are bad. You're much better if you're like throwing a sandbag or beating a <laughs> tractor tire with a yeah. sledgehammer. Yeah. I mean, that's where we've gone now. So in some ways, um, you know, we've moved forward in terms of getting people to understand that intensity is good and that you can achieve a lot in a short time frame. That has really gotten some purchase. And I like to think at least some of that's because of the book kind of spreading into the larger public consciousness, but also that kind of got morphed through 
the research done by people like Gabala. Yeah, yeah, um, high intensity interval training. And high intensity stuff. interval yep. training yep. that got some purchase. And then along with the whole CrossFit ethos of heart is good. Right. Um, so all that kind of rode along with it, um, not like on its back, but in separate little channels that kind of went along with it, um, that kind of morphed things differently. You know, as far as doing any changes to the book, I would probably leave it alone, although I don't know if I would use any sort of phraseology like the big five, mm. because people have kind of, you know, I chose that just um, on the same premise that, um, you know, this piece of equipment here is built upon, which was just simplicity of movement so that newcomers to this could be focused on effort and not on, yeah. you know, coordination yeah, and technique. Yep. Um, but instead, the people that read the book, um, people of a hit mindset tend to be sort of um, newfound religion kind of thinking anyway, doubled down on that and thought there was something magical about those five movements. And you're like, eh, no, 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 no. The you best know, it can be, possible movement. It can be anything. <laughs> you know, I just picked those five because yeah. it covered the body and they're simple. And then there's the weird experience of, you know, having someone come up to you and quote chapter and verse something you said in the book <laughs> that you <laughs> don't even remember <laughs> saying, you know, and you're just like, I said that? <laughs> Didn't sound like me. So, you know. <laughs> well, it's kind of the letter of law, spirit of law stuff. I was right. trying to communicate when we were in Barcelona. It's like, guys, like just open up your minds <laughs> right, a little right, bit more. Right. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. I tell you what, I mean, that, that whole concept went over um, pretty well in Spain because they're a little more yeah. loosey goosey yeah. in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> can't no, do that. No, can't no, no, do no. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah, but what exactly should we be doing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was like, I, I need you to be specific and clear. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, yeah, you don't even have that conversation there. It's like, nope, that's it. <laughs> right on. <laughs> With ARX, and, and you mentioned the machines, you mentioned the barbell, and, um, and we're trying to be forward thinking, future thinking. Um, and, and where do you see kind of the next 10, 20 years? Um, what type of progress maybe do you hope for? Or do you realistically think will 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 be uh, out there as as we continue to move forward? Well, what I'm hopeful for is that um, results will always will hopefully dictate market share. Yeah, and with you know equipment that's focused on you know really efficiently delivering the stimulus and. When you efficiently deliver the stimulus, you also quite conveniently simultaneously avoid injury. Yeah, yeah. So when you're talking about a span of 10 to 20 years, I think results are going to speak for themselves. And a lot of time, I mean, you can get results throwing dog shit at a screen door and hoping something lands on the other side. <laughs> but people Pretty over that span yeah. of time <laughs> are also, you're going to accumulate the injuries yep, and it's going to yep. fall out of favor the same way Running was the thing. Every mm -hmm. it was the Johnny Quest good thing to do until everyone was getting you know hip and knee replacements. I think what's going to happen is people are going to be oriented towards making a realization that um, you know spectacular results can be had in a very time efficient manner, and you don't get hurt also. Yeah, because yeah. you know, and it it is the sort of thing that um, it's sort of like you know self replicating molecules. You get a certain number of them, you set the process in motion, and then something very complex can be generated from it. Yep. I mean, someone walks up to a guy like this, they're going to, you know, what do you do? Yep. How, how do you get in that kind of shape? And when you tell them today, they're going to be like, bullshit, <laughs> let me show you. And then, you know, and they tell two people and so on and so on. So I'm hopeful that in the next 20 years that, you know, results will speak for themselves and it'll mm -hmm. take care of itself. Mm -hmm. The hard part is surviving it. Um, you know, right now, when you look at, you know, the R&D and the financial investment to create something mm -hmm. like this um, or, or other pieces of equipment that can follow this kind of protocol, you are looking at a big financial investment in a time period where everyone's still, you know, flipping tires and beating them with a sledgehammer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, there's lots of stuff on Instagram and the internet and YouTube of, it's like, I want to look like that guy swinging the sledgehammer. <laughs> and, you know, the, the hard part is, is to make a technology like that survive long enough mm -hmm. for 
the self-evident truth to become mm -hmm. self-evident, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, that, and that's the big challenge. And, you know, that's, that's what I still am continuing to try to push. One of the is, things we, yeah, like in one of our videos, we make the point that um, in the area of transportation, uh, technology has changed what cars look like over the last hundred years, unrecognizable. Yeah. So our great grandfathers wouldn't be able to look under the hood of a Tesla and know anything about right. what they're. Yeah. Same thing with communication. Our cell phones, technology has completely changed how communication yeah. works in all these ways, from the old timey phones up to uh, right. what's in our pockets. So we just kind of realized, like our great grandfathers could walk into a CrossFit box and go, "Hey, a barbell." Right. Like and instantly understand exactly yeah. what the technology is that we're using for our strength training, which is weird to us that uh, innovation technologically hasn't visited this area of right. human endeavor. And so in the future, I think it's uh, we kind of all think it's going to be a combination of uh, a pharmaceutical thing like a myostatin inhibitor or yeah. some manner of that. But like the the idea of technology finally visiting yeah. the area of, and of this. And that's the scary thing is y'all you guys are making a Tesla level jump here. And that's always, you know, timing is a big component of all sorts of things. Right. The way we watch TV now is what Arthur Jones envisioned in 1983 when he opened up all the Nala's television. He's like, oh, you'll have a, a, a channel for home repair. You'll have a channel for, you know, makeup. You'll have a channel for dating cooking. and yeah. you're cooking. It's like, <laughs> A whole channel for cooking, yeah, right. And I, and I distinctly remember <laughs> when the iPhone first came out, there was a kind of a, a family, uh, old school family practice guy that's like, he's cutting edge everything. And he drove to Atlanta and camped out two nights <laughs> at the Apple store to get the very first iPhone. And he came in with this iPhone. He's like, look, it's got a camera in it. You can call on the phone. You can do your email through here. Right. It's got an alarm. There's you know, maps. it tells me the time. I don't need a watch in it. And I'm just like, you are retarded. <laughs> that is the stupidest shit I ever seen. He's like, oh, and you got apps. I'm like, what's an app? I'm like, oh, look, like it's got the tiniest violin in the world. You know, when the nurse is wine, I can. So when it's the beer one, you tilt it like this and the beer goes down. Yeah. Like you're it's great. I was just like, are you kidding me? You know? But. Um, time and a place. Yeah. And it's. It's that economics law, Say's law, which Bastiat Say said, supply creates demand. People don't know that they want a Tesla before it's invented. Sure. Mm -hmm. You know, right. so, but it's a huge. Um, it takes entrepreneurial moxie. It takes a lot of guts to have the confidence that what you're going to present to people is going to be the supply that creates the demand, and that's kind of where you're at. And it just, it's what has to be done, you know, and there's not a lot of people that'll do it. So, you know, you're there at the beginning. <laughs> I think it, what you said is pretty profound. Like the, the results will win out, right? Like yeah. over time, 10 years, people look at Body by Science and they're like, yeah, 10 years ago, someone showed me this book and I didn't believe anything they said. But 10 years after that, after I got a knee replaced and that guy did it and he's still right. living a great life, yeah. like I believe him now, right? Like, so it, it, yeah. bear, it bears out over time. Uh, when would, when would you say it was the first prototype of ARX? Like 2009? Yeah, I mean, yeah, around the same, well, honestly, it was the exact same time right. as Body yeah. by Science release because yeah, Doug came Yeah, I came in. out to give a talk to, <laughs> um, in Austin. Yeah. It, yeah. And, that, and you did, it just so happened that, was that the night that I lectured? I can't it remember. It was the exact same time. We physically touched the machines at the same time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Other than maybe and, unloading them and then like, yeah, but it was, it was. Literally, I mean, it got yeah, unboxed yeah. when I dropped yeah, over right. and what, which studio was that? It had the glass windows and yeah, everything. Yeah, I mean, the, it, it's effectively our Rosedale. That's a different location than yeah. our current Rosedale studio, but still, yeah. Yeah, yeah walked in yeah. and it was like, give it a go and. I remember the video, you had to physically reach over and yeah, touch the yeah, handles. Yeah, it was, like, it was a user thing. control idea yeah, that we yeah. don't do anymore, but. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, we were just hacking yeah. at it. <laughs> yeah, I, I relied on Mark to kind of drive the thing because I was so blinded by, because I did it, it's like, okay, if we're going to do this, let's do it as a hyper protocol. Yeah, it's going to yeah, be yeah, as hard yeah, as you yeah, can. Yeah. Right, both ways. Both ways for as long as you can until I just couldn't keep my feet on the, you know, on the pedal anymore. Right. You know, so. <laughs> And it was a, it was an amazing just, experience. Arthur was smiling down on you. Man. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's just the negative thing, you know. Was you know you just can't get that any other way. It's like well, I'm looking at that video, and yeah. I just queued it up the other yeah. day just to watch, just as a reminiscent time. <laughs> but to see that very crude version of that, but it's yeah. the same workout, right? 
but <coughs> we'll talk about the results. Like when we see now the software and we see the disparity yeah. of eccentric and concentric, uh, that over time just keeps proving itself to be a very good selling point for us. But like over time, just proving out what you wrote in Body by Science to say yeah. it, like this does work and we can show it now. And this is, this is gonna keep that book in right. rel relevance for a long time. You know, the other thing is with, as you delve more into the science of what we're doing and the genetics of what we're doing, um, you know, the one thing you you come down to is that there, there really isn't just one be-all, end-all protocol. I think the people that really show really good visible results, you know, the phenotypes of the, the Keith Norris's of the world that have mm -hmm. that kind of phenotype, um, will not express their best phenotype through a body by science protocol. They actually do express a better phenotype through a higher volume, higher frequency kind of thing. It either takes a lot of trial and error to figure that out, um, or you're gonna have to have some sort of quantitative feedback that allows you to figure it out quicker. Sure. And you know, one way is I'm, I imagine that the graphing component allows you guys to figure that out quicker, find out who's a quick deep end rotor versus who's a slow shallow end how rotor. How quick they fall off the cliff. And you know, what, what the recovery intervals look like. You can kind of tune who's gonna be who a little bit earlier in the game. You couple that with some genetic testing mm -hmm. like the guy in uh, oh, yeah. Spain yeah, was yeah. talking about and couple those two things together and then, I mean, you'll be able to figure out and I think the reason Body by Science continues to sell well is everyone looks at the Keith Norris's of the world and makes the assumption is like, train like that dude to look like that dude. Mm -hmm. But right. there's a huge chunk of the population, and I'm not sure what the percentage might be, where when they train like that dude, they run themselves into like the ground <laughs> and they <laughs> actually get like no it. results and it's sometimes negative results sure. and then they just throw up their hands and give up and think... I'm the person that can never get results when in fact, maybe just a different alteration in protocol is what's necessary to get results out of that person. Right. And um, you know, I think that's the real treasure that needs to be unearthed and that is the dark side of the coin of body by science is you, know, you have this huge sub-segment of the population that doesn't respond to what the extreme responders right. respond to and the thing is, whenever in the physical realm you find something that has worked for you, you think, Eureka, I have found the Holy <laughs> Grail, and it applies across all the population, and it doesn't. So, um, you know, hopefully with more objective information, we can tear down the walls right. between these different training camps and realize that there's a continuum there and the other thing is, is sometimes you have a true believer that doesn't realize they're in the wrong camp. Mm. Right. Mm. You know, and if we can break down that, those barriers and see that there is a continuum, maybe you can get people to start thinking in a more objective way where they might be really hardcore in this one camp and it may not be the right camp for them. You can pluck them out and plug them in where they belong and then all of a sudden everyone's getting good results. No, that's really perceptive. I mean, one of the things we see a lot of times is uh, people, they ask us, they lean on us, rightfully so. I mean, we have a lot of experience seeing the data and watching people go through progressions. But they're like, how, how often should people exercise? Like, how often should they do this workout? Yeah. And I say, as m literally as much as they would like. Let them run yeah. at whatever level they want to run at. If they want to come in five times a week, figure out a way to get them on there five times a week. But then the data will we'll ultimately point to, point to whether or not they can be. do it. Yeah. And so that's, that's something that, from a practitioner standpoint, is just so invaluable yeah. because you don't need well, yeah. 20 years of experience kind of feedback, like you guys. Probably the better approach is start them out at a fairly maximal intensity and then bleed back exactly. until yeah. Um, yeah. they it's declare themselves rather than start out you know, once every seven days and then it's like, could they be doing it? I don't know. I don't know. Right, <laughs> especially with a new client. Yep. You're going to want them to progress as fast yeah. as possible. And they're too weak to really give themselves a big hit anyway. Yeah, So and you burn through the whole neuromotor learning phase quicker. A faster. Right. Yep. And don't misattribute that to recovery issues when it's, in fact, just learning issues. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, the, it's cool to be able to kind of quantitate that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. it also uh, gets rid of that period of time where uh, with a, a 
a system where more balance and agility and coordination is necessary yeah. with weights or a CrossFit gym or even just with um, selectorized machines, uh, before I can give someone a really meaningful amount of resistance, I've got to train them for a number yeah. of weeks to get them to move correctly and perform turnarounds. Right, and, and that was the cool. I mean, the first time I ever saw this was on the Renex equipment that had the graphic feedback. And what the graphic feedback kind of gives you is that, you know, all roads lead to Rome, but when you get a graphic feedback and you're just doing like a time static contraction versus a dynamic thing, and the dynamic thing just kind of goes ink, 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 and then off the cliff. Right. Versus the time static contraction is just like steady, 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 steady off the cliff. Um, or you can just like go all out and go up, 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 down, 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 down <laughs> off the cliff. You know, all the different roads lead to Rome, but what you can figure out is that there are very circuitous roads to Rome on which you can accomplish other things, or there are very direct roads to Rome right. as well, you know. Um, and there are also circuitous roads to Rome that, you know, lead to injury town. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, and you can figure out what's what, though, yeah. is if you actually get some feedback, uh, as opposed to just figuring it out by feel or intuitively, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we, look at, uh, we look at this much like you would with a prescription or a dosage of medicine, right? Yeah. It's like, is this a, do we want a gram or do we need a milligram? Like, what's the deal here? And we don't oftentimes know that, but we know that no one's going to get injured with at least ARX. Uh, and we can test that out. And we give them a little too much, okay, so they just get weaker numbers the next time around. Yeah. We back that off a little bit, right? Or somebody who's a high responder, they're just crushing it. Like maybe we can, we can double them up, right? Yeah. So there's, there's ways to modulate uh, the dosage. And that's one thing that I think when we've come – when we train people and we see people out there, it's, it's just a really valuable tool to get people what they want, right? To get the roam. Yeah. But we want to get them there efficiently. Some people need twice a week. Other people, once is good. Right. Or like five times if you're an athlete and you want to like, you only have three months to train, you got to get that neurological adaptation. You got to get as much strength as possible and then they're gone. So we have that ability, I think, and that's, that's something that's different than 10 years ago. Yeah. It's just to be able to see sure. it now, like visualize it. Right. And like all the stuff that all the practitioners out there in the hit world are talking about, it's just nice to know that like most of it's true, but how true is it, right? And in each person, it's always dynamic. Yeah. Like, and in each person, not only is it dynamic, but it's going to change over time. Right. Right. What was, you know, <laughs> the thing six months in can be completely different 18 months in. Right. Um, you know, because the architecture of everything is changing along the way. You know? Right. And well, life. that's like matched resistance that adapts to you. Like we all talk about how, yeah, it matches today. It's going to match eccentric yeah. and yeah. concentric, and that changes through a set and limb length and pination angle and all right. sorts of stuff. But to your point, six months on, your strength curve, eccentric and concentric, right. is going to look different. Yeah, and with sharper and the shape of it's going to change. Yeah. Yeah. The muscle gets yeah. bigger, the pination angles change. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and so, know, how do you account for that? Change. How do you know? I have a sixth sense. I can tell when that's going to happen. I'm going to set you a different weight in this different yeah. way for today. It's like you don't know. And you also yeah. be able to see it, at some point there may be a threshold where bigger is no longer stronger because right. of you know angles of pull and things right. of that nature. Yeah, it's so. like the football inflating. Yeah, I mean, yeah. lots lots of stuff that you'll be able to see so that hadn't been seen before. Right. Just thought about. <laughs> <laughs> true. Well, it's true. cool to see all that borne out. Like the first time my, my godfather, Corky, in 2014 had a knee replacement. So it was going to happen in November. And, uh, you know, we always hear, you know, you always read, it's concentric strength and isometric and then eccentric strength. And that's how strong we are in the different phases. And it was when I did his isometric, like, pre-operation to get him as strong as possible before the surgery. Two weeks on is eight weeks of acute rehab and the insurance stopped paying, so he comes back. And I watched his uh, isometric strength get better and better until he had earned a range of motion. I'm feeling good, let's, yeah. let's do it. And I gave him a two inch range of motion, standardized, <laughs> slowed down, and it was precisely what you'd expect. It was so cool to see his small peak, big peak, small peak, big peak, just yeah. concentric, eccentric. And then when I pressed his pre-surgery you know, isometric, it was, right in the middle yeah and it's like oh shit they're right like right. yeah that's exactly ah <laughs> oh, cool like it's yeah. exactly how strong we are uh but it's just great to get that feedback and and know the difference yeah 
Yeah. I mean, one concept, I mean, we, we have, have a few macro concepts and goals and objectives. And again, you said earlier, it takes some entrepreneurial, uh, I don't remember what phrase you used, but yeah, I mean, and, and earning gray hairs and whatever else uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> over the course of the years. But, um, but, but a, a big macro goal for us is to democratize exercise, namely resistance exercise. And so obviously, I mean, it depends on what, what you're reading, but let's just, for simple math, say 10% of the population uh, does strength training. That's not good enough. So how do, what are some of the steps that you see that, you know, whether it's through ARX or, or, or just what are your thoughts on how do we get there? How do we get the 10% to 20%? How do we continue to stair-step that up? Yeah, I think it's like we talked about before. Basically, it's by doing, um, doing what we do. Yeah. And I think the neat thing about, you know, studios that do, um, you know, scientifically based exercise is that what you're tapping is, and that number probably more accurately is around 4% okay. of the population. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what you're doing is you're tapping that invisible graveyard. And those people, if you actually give them results when they failed elsewhere, and the funny thing is, is these people, by putting themselves out there as, you know, the real achiever, all the people that you see on YouTube that scream all this motivational <laughs> shit behind, you know, their workout, um, when you do it and fail to produce results, you feel like you are the failure. Mm -hmm. So when you are able to take someone like that, bring them in, give them results, remove that sense of themselves as being a failure they're going to talk to other people about it and it's going to spread. Right now, the marketing genius of CrossFit is it's the same marketing genius as how you pick Navy SEALs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you bring someone, you know, to San Diego to become a Navy SEAL, all of that training isn't to toughen them up and get them in condition. And No, basically it's just find out who can survive yeah, some really horrendous yeah, shit yeah. and just weed out the crap. Um, and then what you're left with is some really, you know, pretty damn studly people. Yeah. And that's kind of basically the whole marketing genius of CrossFit is you've created this thing where unless you are of the phenotype that's going to express really astounding results with really abusive protocol, you're going to fall out by the weight size. So you're self-selecting all these people that look good. And we're not even including, you know, CrossFit games and the performance-enhancing drugs mm -hmm. that go yeah, along with yeah, that. As the sport. Yeah. <laughs> you take that off. Even taking that off the table, you still have such a self-selection going on for this tiny sliver of the population. And, and that's their whole you know, the power of their marketing is the visible results that these people produce through this self-selection yeah. process. You know, it's like... And then they layer on top of it, you know, all of this military machismo and naming everything after dead soldiers and shit. And it gets this whole Johnny Quest vibe to it that your average, you know, 35-year-old yuppie that, you know, still, you know. That, Living the but, dream. Yeah. But yeah, that, that's a tiny sub-segment. give up the ghost. And what's happening is they are throwing aside a huge sub-segment of the population that falls out. The attrition rate is huge. The injury rate is huge. And when you don't get results and you got injured and you can come do something and you do get results and you don't get injured, that is going to eventually snowball. And I think we're on that cusp right now. I mm. think that's the good thing for anyone starting a business in this realm, manufacturing equipment in this realm, is that we are on a cusp where that can happen. The hard part being a facility owner is right now, <clears throat> you know, if you want equipment, there's, it's hard to get, you know, you, it's hard to get medics unless you buy a complete line. They're not going to fire up the factory to do it. You know, you got to find used Renex, you got to find used super slow systems if you're going to have anything of that caliber. Or, you know, you can go with, you know, there's good companies out there that make plate loaded equipment mm -hmm. um, that, you know, are well suited towards doing, you know, efficient protocols. But then when you look at running 100 clients through a day and having to load, you know, you, know, you got yeah. a 240-pound dude and the next person on your schedule is a 98-pound grandma, yeah. 
you know, the loading and unloading <laughs> of plates can get pretty old and everything. So, you know, um, but I think the market is there and it's huge. It's, it's a big invisible graveyard that's ready to be tapped. And, um, you know, I think it's just a matter of doing it. And I think the word of mouth is more powerful than anything. And the word of mouth is made much easier to spread by Instagram and YouTube and things like that because that technology, once someone starts looking at that, you know, right. the, the technology behind that is like it feeds you what you like and it will give yeah. you more of that and it will tap, you know, and, and that kind of, um, you know, it, it spreads like a wildfire. So I think that's kind of where we're at and I think it's very possible for that democratization yeah. to take place pretty quickly. Well, and it's going to happen in, you know, these kind of <clears throat> new models of, of healthcare. Um, we don't have to dive too much into the sick care versus healthcare issue we're in, but I mean, both these guys see more of our facilities doing installations. And I guess, Mike, like talk a little bit about kind of what you see in that new model and then, you know, how that, uh, if there's any wisdom or encouragement you could kind of uh, give to some of those new, new yeah. guys trying to start up. So, I mean, basically it's, it's people who are fed up either because they've personally been churned through that system mm -hmm. and not received the yeah. health care that they hoped for. A loved one or just they're just sitting on the sidelines and they feel like they need to take the torch because the complex, the yeah. industry is not, uh, not carrying that torch for them. And that's, that's great. The, our, our customers are, are amazing people who have like really big dreams to help a lot of people. Uh, but what they're realizing is that this is the, the, the foundation for the majority of them, right? Is they have a strength training foundation, which is great. Uh, but people are real sick. And there's a lot of people who have a variable set of problems. Um, so they're adding infrared saunas and they're adding other technology. And I think when you were talking about like timing is everything, yeah. now we live in a world where that's, I instantly can go learn about 10 technologies reach out to all 10 of those people and they can ship one <laughs> to my, within a relative short yeah. time period. So the barrier to entry is now lower than ever where you don't necessarily need a full line of MedEx yeah. or any of those. You don't have to hunt down anybody for that. And so then they're creating these systems where a lot of people can, can join and get there quickly and do it safely um, that's all backed by science. And I don't think there's ever been a time when you could do all of that so quickly and do it as effectively as it, yeah. they're, they're trying to put together. And ultimately, like, is that now the answer is our question. Like, is that the way that we need to go Yeah, I, to help Well, people? I think it's definitely a sub-segment of where you can go. And <clears throat> I got to couple what you said with um, never has the motivation been higher for someone that is in the traditional healthcare system to find a way to extract themselves out of it. Right. I mean, I mean yeah. running mock facility, writing Body by Science, doing speaking gigs, all those sort of things is a huge degree motivated by my desire to extricate myself from that realm because yeah. it's horrible. Hmm. Um, you know, I won't beat the negative side of the equation too much, but it gives you know, perspective. Though. Any, you were talking about it earlier. Yeah, anyone yeah. watching this needs to understand is like inside the healthcare system, um, patients are so sick. You know, they come to us with the wheels falling off and they are so sick that, you know, you're completely wrapped up in, you know, disaster management and life-saving interventions and just tuning them up well enough to get booted out of the hospital again. And then they'll circle back around and it's just a never-ending cycle. And to any extent, any you know, for me in the emergency department, any attempt I would make to try to counsel a patient on diet or exercise or lifestyle or anything, I'm not going to get 30 seconds into it before yeah. another ambulance comes in the back door with someone that's like crashing. You know, I've not done anything uninterrupted in at least a decade wow. in that place. I mean, that's how bad it is. But family practice and, and medicine since Obamacare has been um, commoditized. Obamacare basically just allowed an economic system for these giant cartels, these big health systems to buy out smaller hospitals and health systems and create these gigantic conglomerates. And physicians have been driven out of their private practice into employment situations that are very controlled. 
there's very little autonomy, and you see that what you're doing is futile, that it's a patch job, they get booted back out, and they bounce back in, and it's just over and over. Right. And there are a lot of primary care physicians, um, there's a lot of people in the chiropractic realm, a lot of people that are in the healthcare realm that are like, you know, I'm not benefiting people. And I can personally tell you, I mean, there's not a day that you go to work in an ER where you don't, you know, in air quotes, save a life. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that the amount of good that I have done for people in my own shop, in my own facility, and through doing these kind of things, greatly exceeds anything that I've ever done in medicine. Um, so docs are wanting to pull out of that system. And when they can open up a shop that kind of combines sort of a wellness practice, a primary care, mm -hmm. with turning around people that are on this, on this slide of the metabolic syndrome. And we, we talked about this earlier. You can take anyone anywhere along that continu continuum, even at the very end stages of it, and turn them around. I mean, the first step is just to invoke high intensity exercise, to empty out glycogen stores, to restore insulin sensitivity, that's step one. And then you can just build from there. But you can take someone, and the vast majority of the modern population is already on that slippery slope. They're just not very far along the continuum. And people that are just starting down that slippery slope on that continuum, it's very easy to pull them back to what is their genotypical birthright and that is to be, you know, naturally lean, you know, naturally appetite controlled, highly functional, highly strong, metabolically healthy, hunter-gatherer type person who naturally inclines towards a 10 to 11 percent body fat, body composition, just spontaneously and organically. That's very easy to do with the right knowledge and the right technology. What you're saying is that in your, in your world, in the, me in the medical field in general, uh, that's, that's not going to, you're not going to have time to impart that knowledge, to impart those There's no time and there's principles. no mindset. There's no mindset for it, okay? And I, and I don't mean this in any sort of derogatory way, but when I go to work, my mindset is not that I am, people are so metabolically deranged, they are so, so far down that health continuum that you're not even really dealing with the human animal anymore. You're mm. dealing with a disease state that you are pulling back from the brink. And a lot of pulling back from the brink means that you actually have to do things that might temporarily make them worse in order to be able to pull them back off the cliff. Mm. So it's a very unique set of manipulations that you're doing that are very far removed from interventions that you take to uh, restore and maintain health. It's a completely different thing. So your average doc um, can't even have this conversation that you and I are having. Their mind is not filled with that at all. You know, you're, you're thinking of very advanced pharmaceutical manipulations to pull someone off the cliff of cardiogenic shock and multi-system organ failure. And that's just a completely different animal than a human that's on this continuum of the metabolic syndrome that we're pulling back to normal, healthy, natural, human, non-zoo human state. It's, it's a different mm. language altogether. Um, most doctors, most physicians that are taking care of patients in the current system can't speak that language. And if you try to speak that language to them, they'll look at you like you got two heads. Right. So I guess that begs the question, if that's the current setup for our healthcare system, how do we save or how do we help the people uh, to get to where we know that they can get to, right? To, to solve the insulin problem, to mm -hmm. be more metabolically conditioned. How do we get there? How do we, what, is, what are the hurdles that we have to jump now because of this new system that's kind of been forced upon us? Yeah, the thing is, is the more, like you get someone in the early stages of that continuum you pull them back over to normal, healthy, non-zoo human. Um, as you do that, you'll get people further along the continuum coming to you, and then it's just a stepwise process. Um, and eventually, you're gonna have someone that's one-third to halfway down that continuum that's a doc. You pull a few of those out of the belly of the beast, 
And all of a sudden, they'll be like, they'll start sending patients to you. Mm. The other thing is um, the demographics of our society is changing so rapidly towards the elderly shift. You bring this sort of technology into, you know, there, there's big, big money now on the Medicare side of things of having these communities where you start out in an apartment and you go to assisted living. Right. And then you go to, you know, it, you know more Skilled advanced care, like that, and then yeah. you go to memory care unit, and then you go to pine box unit. <laughs> you know, and it's just this... Not a lot um, of turnover in pine boxes. But, you know, there's, um, there's huge opportunities to incorporate this sort of stuff on the more upstream end of that. And that gives you an opportunity to demonstrate you know, how this works. Well, and also I think in Spain you had mentioned something about the palliative care. Um, I mean, you could you could talk about that briefly, but I yeah. mean, yeah, that's at one end of the spectrum, but I think it makes people, once they've aged a certain amount, kind of realize like either, either because they've seen their parents go through it or they are getting closer. Uh, I guess speak to that a little bit. I, I thought that was an interesting, just yeah. the chair test and then how that. Well, yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, and you yeah. can see it in Spain. I don't know how many tours you went on and stuff yeah. like that, but there's elderly people on a tour and the tour bus stops, half the bus gets off, half the bus stays on. Yeah. And the half that stays on, when the other people come back on the bus, it's like, we're the same age, what's going on here, mm -hmm. kind of thing. And the more you can generate people that get off that bus and go take the tour, the more the word gets out, and that really does bear fruit. But the other thing is, is I think economically, medicine is starting to be able to say, save us from ourselves because uh, I talked about this in Spain. I recently went to a Grand Rounds where the emergency medicine um, attendings and residents intermingle with the surgery and trauma faculty and residents and it, it was a Grand Rounds and we had the trauma director from Vanderbilt, Rick Miller, came to talk to us and he was part of this, uh, it's called a Paleate Consortium. And, you know, back when I was in med school and residency, trauma surgery was like, you know, the top gun shit because it was all knife and gun club, all, you know, car wrecks and things like that, which are generally young, healthy people where you take these dynamic interventions, they have quick turnarounds, you discharge them from the hospital. But now um, the trauma services are completely overrun. The number one occupant of the trauma services in hospitals now are elderly falls. What happens is wow. you get up, you fall, you break a hip, you fracture a pelvis, you break seven ribs, you collapse a lung, maybe you lacerate your spleen or liver. You're multi-trauma. You're on the trauma service. Worse than a stab wound. And what they found out was they actually had done some research, and it basically boiled down to this, is that if you were a person that could sit in a chair and stand up, you would get off the trauma service if you had multi-trauma. If you were an old person that had to use the arms of a chair to get up out of the chair and stand up, you had about a 50% chance of getting off the trauma service. If you were a person that required assistance to get out of the chair, you're not getting off the trauma service. You're going to die. Pine box again. Yeah. You're on, yeah you, pine box at PBABS is what we call it. Pine box at bedside. Oh. 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 And... Um, so now there's this huge move called the Paleate Consortium where they have social workers on the trauma service to early on they apply these metrics to, de to decide functional ability in the elderly pre-injury to decide whether they stay on the trauma service and get full treatment oh, wow. or whether the social workers meet with the family, hang crepe, and move them into a hospice or palliative care setting. Jesus. And that's where it is now. People that are, you know, me included, heading towards your older years need to understand is like, if you do not have that level of functional ability, if something, A, something like that is more, much more likely to happen to you, and when it happens, that's it. You're done. Um, but the thing is, is the biological processes that create this stimulus response relationship are intact throughout the lifespan. No matter how debilitated you become, that 
adaptive response is intact and you can take the very frail elderly and you can rehab them up to, you know, hey, you guys do this all the time, completely functional levels. Sure. Come in on a walker, 12 weeks later, you know, you're getting off the bus and taking the tour. And the people that are on that palliative end of the spectrum um, are also the ones that really sap the system of resources. And that's why there's this huge move to have social workers intervene early and get these people on the hospice pathway. Because if they stay on the other pathway, monetarily the amount of resources they consume are breaking the system. But eventually medicine's going to realize that, um, and society's going to realize that um, we can't treat elderly people this way. We've got to treat elderly people like you're going to be functional into your 90s and yeah. 100s. And we need you to not retire and to continue contributing to society because, you know, Social Security and Medicare, you know, regardless of what any politician tells you, you know, were really functionally, financially broke a decade ago. Right. And the demographics is such that there's not enough young people being born and coming into the workforce to offset the number of baby boomers that are becoming truly elderly. And unless we have an elderly, strong, and functional population, we will crump our economy. And I think if we play it right and we can demonstrate how we can turn that around, um, then we'll be able to, you know, be the change leaders and all that. Is it as simple as supplying them with strength training so that those falls don't happen? Do you find that that's, yeah. that's, that's pretty much it? If like that, is I mean, that the, the key whole, to, to the door? I mean, so much of the general populace and the medical world assumes that it's a stiffness issue or a you know, balance organ or an in internal yeah. ear mm -hmm. issue. But really, riding yourself against gravity and not falling is a matter of type 2B muscle fibers being right. able to kick in and correct. If you are vertical to gravity, everything's hunky dory. And, you know, you've been standing in a crowd before, you know and someone bumps into you or you step off, step off a curb this high that you didn't realize was there, that's an instant. I mean, lots of type 2 fibers kick in suddenly and you correct your posture. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is, it does take a lot of strength to do that because you're talking about a very long lever that's, you know, you, you have 15 degrees and a really long lever, that's a lot of force to correct. Right. If you're an old person that's profoundly weak, someone bumps you, you're going down. Whereas you or I, you know, someone's going to bump us and we're not going to spill our beer. You know? <laughs> That's valuable. You could yeah. fall down the <laughs> stairs <laughs> very important. Um, but yeah, I mean, it really is that simple. That's what prevents falls is strength. I mean, you can have arthritic joints. You can have, you know, shitty balance. You can have vertigo. You know, you can have Meniere's disease. And if you're strong, you're not going to fall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, that's, it really is that simple. There was a client, uh, I don't know if you remember, if you were still there, uh, Bonnie was the 62-year-old woman who the first time I had her in, I told her to go at maximum and she wasn't even breathing hard by the end. She couldn't work hard, uh, just neurologically was unable mm -hmm. to push. And her, like our peaks on ARX and yours in a moment, small peak and then like a spike, like yeah. Rocky Mountain, big peak, but hers were rolling hills. Right. And the concentric was still less than the eccentric, but... There was, it was a, a, a strange, I didn't understand it at first, but then only five or six weeks later, just once per week, she had regained a youthful profile. Her, yeah. it looked like, and so that to me meant she was regaining those lost type two fibers, able to exactly. fire up from yeah. zero to max eccentric and right now. It's not now. just that you lose your fibers, the body's very efficient right. at responding to stimulus. And if the stimulus is, you know, lack of loading and lack of activity, then those type 2B motor units get functional, excuse me, functionally denervated right. very quickly. You're going to pull the spark plugs off those pistons. Yeah. And that's why you get that smooth rolling mountain because you're just completely missing that sharp spiky peak that you see on the graphic output there, which largely represents those higher order motor units. They've just unplugged those puppies. Yeah. But if you flog them a couple times, they'll re innervate those. They will make the metabolic investment for that. Based on necessity. You know, if if the if the biological signal's been sent to you is that, you know, 
you've, you've broken your ankle and you're laying out in the savanna and you're not going to move, you know, you're going to unplug everything that's metabolically expensive in order to hopefully survive, heal, and maybe make it. That's the biological message that's coming across there. Um, but as soon as you do something to wake it back up, then the survival benefit of that metabolic investment, that risk-benefit ratio changes, they'll plug that stuff back in and all of a sudden you got the normal graphic signature that you're used to seeing because you brought those motor units back on board. Yeah, I think most people don't realize how little is required. Right. It, was, yeah. it was 10 minutes over six weeks. And I think that's that's back. one of the, yeah. the, the thoughts that keeps coming to me is this exercise as medicine. Like people un somewhat understand that, but I don't think, you know, going back to Ken Hutchins, if, you know, he did a lot of good things. One was always trying to define exercise. But I think defining exercise prescription and maybe from the MD community is not, it, we haven't done it justice yet. We haven't um, continued down that path long enough to say, what is this non-invasive outpatient procedure? It's not in a pill form, but trying to define that. And, you know, when, when y'all were talking, it was interesting to think, like, those peaks are a signal of right. success. You right. know, so what are we looking for? What are we prescribing? I mean, I guess talk about that yeah. a little bit, just how well, simple it Also, there's be. going yeah. to be a transition when we talk about prescribing. Right now, the whole mindset of prescribing is what medication that we can, can we produce that addresses a problem with a massive amount of the population that has illness X. So you're looking at how can I make money off a bunch of sick yeah, yeah. versus coming to the realization that that is just going to implode our economy mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden seeing value and how do we, um, because right now the way medicine is being reimbursed is no longer on, it, they're trying to make the transition from being a fee for service, you know, we make money by doing things mm -hmm. to a, um, to one of we make money by not spending it kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And when they see that, you know, all of that end of life, I mean, 90% of our healthcare expenditures are spent in the last two weeks of these sick people's lives. 90%? Mm. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So, once someone gets sick enough where they land in the ICU and then they flounder around for a week or two and then die, 90% of the healthcare expenditure in a person's life is going to happen in the last two weeks of their life. Wow. So that's where extricating them from that system mm -hmm. altogether, where you just go along at a high physiologic headroom and then you just drop. drop. Yeah. Right. Um, right. That's where society is going to save a ton of money. And as soon as someone makes the realization that, you know, this is how we're going to survive economically as a country, as a society, and as a species, frankly, right. then I think that's where the tipping point's going to happen. And I think the demographics of our society makes that tipping we'll point tip earlier yeah. than we realize. Yeah. Man. Well, so, and, there, and, and, you know, there, there is a lot of money being spent in anti-aging and, and, and that type of market, if you will. And I know you talk about and have talked about for the last years the Malov study and kind of the genetic yeah. expression being uh, back to a youthful state. We don't really have to dive into that too much. But to me, you know, there's this fountain of youth idea that, that resistance exercise at a sufficient intensity level can get that. So why aren't more people doing it? Or why isn't the anti-aging yeah. you know, community well, uh, and marketplace starting to capitalize on that? Let me more? back it up a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Um, so I'm really, I'm really psyched about the potential of life extension technology. Um, and the life extension technology, in my opinion, and I'm not a scientist, so I don't have to play that cautious bullshit game <laughs> that they do whenever they're interviewed by a newspaper. Making health claims. And I think right now, today, the technology exists where we could all live to 120, 140. Yeah, no agreed. problem. Yeah. But I think right now, um, the elites and the people in political power, because of the current paradigm of how the elderly sap society monetarily because of the way that currently exists is that we can't afford to have people living into their 70s, much less into their hundreds. 
So the current orientation is to try to squelch all that and put the brakes on it. And it's being held back Especially enormously. Especially people are retiring at 60. Yeah, so, and I think the yeah. very important thing is to, um, to be able to demonstrate that with proper application of knowledge and technology that you can be in your 70s and literally function like someone in their 40s and continue to be productive rather than retire. And I think the world's got to figure out that, number one, retirement is bullshit, that it really is just a marketing scheme for mutual fund companies mm -hmm. and not really a strategy for life. Right. So that, that's just bullshit. That, um, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen the study where they look at hunter, modern hunter-gatherers and they look at the caloric energy that the hunter-gatherer produces versus the caloric energy that they consume. And as long as they are producing more caloric energy than they consume, their life expectancy marches out in front of them in a way where they can't detect when their death will be. Jesus. But all of a sudden, at one point where you cross the threshold where you now consume more than you produce, you have 18 months to live. Wow. <laughs> wow. That, in my opinion, is retirement. Yeah. Oh, and that's what retirement yeah. was built yeah. upon in the early days. That's when people had pensions because they knew you could give a person a pension, because they'll be dead in a couple years. Because they're going to be dead yeah. in 18 yeah. months, wow. and that's the way it worked. Yeah. But now we're propping people up that are this sicker than hell with medicines long enough to where we've, we've broken the pension system. No one gets a pension anymore. You can put something into your 401k, and then your, you know, your account manager can brag how he got you 7% this year. But the real objective rate of inflation is probably 8 or 9%, not the 3% that they've jiggered the numbers for. So no one has a war chest of money where you're living off interest. You're just doing a buy down. And then you're racing the clock and playing this game of, you know, how much do I spend relative to how much longer do I have to live? And that's no way to live. So strength training becomes even more important. Right. And I, but what I'm saying is that in terms of the question you're answering is there's going to be a paradigm shift in attitude of I can't count on retiring and, you know, just and then behaving any way I want to and, and count on medicine and doctors to say because that doesn't work. That's not an existence. And there's a, yeah, there's a futurist book I was reading recently that said someone being born today <laughs> is most likely going to have to contribute and work until they're 90. Right. I think that's not too far off from, from what will happen. No, and yeah. that's exactly yeah. what I yeah. plan on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's, I think, what people are going, there's going to become a reckoning very soon where people are going to realize that's what it's going to have to be. But if concurrent with that reckoning, we can bring this sort of technology and our sort of understanding of health to that reckoning, then you have a mechanism where you can extend health span long enough where people are no longer threatened by the extension of lifespan. Because all of a sudden you have people that are functional and have accumulated all of this knowledge over time that can continue to express it and the productivity curve from that will go up exponentially. I think if this sort of technology can express itself broadly enough concurrently with that kind of reckoning, then that's going to usher in not only our extension of health span, but then open up the true potential for the ex extension of lifespan. Because you look at China, you look at the United States, you look at any major economic power, and their demographics do not support economic survival unless something like that happens. Right. And this sort of thing is integral to that being even possible. If we know this, right, we have the genetic expression study, it was 180 out of 300 expressed yeah. more youthful after doing resistance training exercise. So we're, you wrote the book 10 years ago, and you said now there's a body, even a larger growing body of research and definitive things that are pointing to the benefits of this type of work, this exercise. What are the hurdles? What are people who know that stuff or they hear about it on the news now, it's in the ether somewhere and it comes in their world? Like, what are the reasons why somebody wouldn't partake 
<laughs> well, I think right now and the reasons are is, uh, like everyone's so busy dealing with people that are so sick. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. And two is, like I said, right now the demographics are such that people living longer, you know, the system is worried about crumping itself. But I think that that transition is occurring. So, you know, we'll talk about that Simon Milov study. And the sense I get from it is that, you know, he's done other studies since then. And it's a long series of studies that have nothing to do with that. I don't even think he, and I don't want to speak, I don't want to say anything. <laughs> but to me, it looks like I don't even think he realizes the implications of what uh -huh. he did with that. And I think only people that have seen what can be done with people with this kind of technology and this kind of understanding of the human physiology can appreciate that research, okay? So what Mayloff did was he used a statistical method called a false discovery rate, and it's a very complicated statistical analysis to figure out what's different between someone that's 75 versus someone that's 25. And the real genius is it he did it only on mitochondrial genes. So every, every bit of DNA and RNA that's in your, all your mitochondrial genetics comes only from your mother's side. Right. So it's very ancient and it's very well preserved and there's nothing muddying the water there at all. So he identified a huge number of genes that were different between 75 and 25 and found some, I forget what the number was, 180 odd genes that reverted back in a 75 year old to the same expression in a 25 year old. And that's mitochondrial and DNA? Mitochondrial that's DNA. So you're talking about the powerhouse of the cell. You're talking about the thing that makes that whole fight or flight process where you're able to turn your metabolism on a dime from energy intake to energy output. The entire thing on which our entire biology's survival is predicated upon, you're identifying in there a reversion back to age 25 from 70. It's insane. It's like, it's mind boggling. And you know, when I saw it, I was just like, you know, it's like this changes everything. You know, someone's either gonna be all over this or locked up in an insane asylum. That's all, <laughs> those are the two choices. <laughs> right. And it was like nothing, crickets. And it still is, you know, because still the whole paradigm is towards squelching anything to do with life extension because we're afraid of it now, because of how the demographics um, matches up against the non-existent war chest for Social Security and Medicare and propping that bull crap up through another election cycle. Um, so there's that. And then people within the healthcare system are so preoccupied and busy with putting the wheels on that have fallen off that you know, that sort of thing just seems like, you know, Isaac Asimov kind of fantasy crap. Right. Well, in some um, ways, I feel... But, but the thing is, is like, if we could get those demographic issues off the table and make people understand that this is where everything pivots, the technology for all that actually exists right now, yeah. and probably 85, 90% of the backbone of that is just these sort of simple applications doing high-intensity exercise and appropriate, you know, dietary interventions and lifestyle interventions and, you know, it, it's easy. It's like shooting fish in a barrel, really. It really is. Yeah, that's what I was saying. I, I think people think, surely it can't be this simple, yeah. but it is. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is, it, is it merely like a, an evidence thing? Does somebody need to see the graph go up? Do they need, like, what are the, what are the hurdles that somebody who's gonna, they hear about a study like that, they're in that age range, like my parents. Like yeah. uh, I don't know how long I've been working for it, five, yeah, six years, and I still can't be, get them to understand this. Yeah. It might be, but I think that the real answer to your question when you run into that kind of brick wall is it's not an evidence thing, it's a cognitive dissonance thing. Because mm -hmm. when you find, and you'll see this in your elderly, I don't, I don't know if you, I do, I see it in our elderly clients. Well, all of a sudden, in, in a matter of weeks, they've made this massive turnaround. And they're 72 years old. Right there's a massive cognitive dissonance to overcome to realize, holy shit, you mean I could have done this when I was 38? <laughs> in all those years, in all that time, I wasted not availing myself of it. I think 
the huge hurdle that we are overcoming right now is the cognitive dissonance that we present to people when we show them it really is that easy. The fact that it's so easy invokes such a massive cognitive dissonance that it's almost unbearable. And I think people psychologically just blind themselves to it altogether. Because there are people that will, you know, will be referred by clients that have had major massive turnarounds that will come in and just outright reject it. Right. And the rejection, I think, is because that cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just cannot square the fact that you were that wrong for that long. Right. <laughs> and to me, there are still things that I figure out about training and working out and stuff that is like, shit, I'm 56 right now. And it's like, <laughs> it's like why can I have not? And, it, and the things I figure out are like incredibly simple things. Right. Right. You know, it's like, why could I have not figured that out when I was 36? I mean, how different would have that 20 year span been sure. if I had figured out, you know, that there were, you know, more ways to skin the cat mm -hmm than just, you know, 12 sets to failure three times a week, hammer the crabs, like because Arthur Jones said so. Yeah, right. Or because Ken Hutchins said, whatever, fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, That's what and, we're sort of up against as well. Yeah. With, because uh, people see this and they don't understand what's behind the shield. Yeah. So they go, oh, I know all about machines. Because in their heads, it's free weights and machines right. instead of gravity based versus non gravity yeah. based. And so it's that cognitive dissonance. Well, just throw a motor on it. I can't, it can't be that simple. There's got to be an algorithm. There's got to be something yeah. going on in there that's, nope, nope, it's, uh, it's this motor that... Well, I'm sure if someone really wanted gravity, you could probably program 9.32 feet per <laughs> right. second squared or whatever it is <laughs> pretty easily, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. just... Uh, and, that, and that's the other thing is things that we take as natural and mysterious are really pretty basic math. <laughs> right. And when you... When you point that out to people, is again you're triggering that cognitive dissonance kind of thing, right? Or what must that mean about me if I was unable to discover this for myself for all these decades? So right. I can't accept your idea because then that would mean yeah, yeah. But that's the cool thing, though, is that this huge neglected segment of the population that maybe tried the more visible approach and failed at it, they also don't carry a lot of the baggage that we all carried that kept us from figuring things out sooner. Yeah, fresh eyes yeah. from yeah, the outside. Yeah, they got learners, they, they got beginner's mind, and they come to it yeah. um, with a more open um, mindset. So the nice thing about it is when we talk about this tipping point that we want is that this huge swatch of the population that we can tap doesn't necessarily carry that cognitive dissonance with us. And a lot of times I think that's what we met within our own silo was, you know, we chose which, um, which sect of hit we were going to attach ourselves to. When evidence was available, if it didn't jive with our sect, it took a long time for the cognitive dissonance to become uncomfortable where we would finally relent. That's what you don't have to overcome in that huge swatch of the population that will come to you as clients. Yeah, they don't have a bone to pick right. about right. X, Y, or Z. Yeah. So. Yeah. That seems to be the person who gravitates to ARX. Yeah. yeah. And other, other than just the general initial, um, this doesn't square with everything I've seen in the popular realm or in the popular press, or these guys just trying to shine me on kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but I think enough has happened in that realm you know, most people have lived through enough, you know, big changes. Right, and everyone's ready yeah. for that. The rate of change is speeding up as yeah. well. So everyone's ready for a tablet. Everyone's ready for proving right. it with numbers. Everyone's ready yeah. for, like, new technology in all these or different Or even ways. if they're not, they've been exposed to enough of it where they realize it doesn't matter if I'm ready or not. <laughs> yeah, here <laughs> it like, comes. This yeah. is happening yeah. in, my car, to the right. in my car, yeah. in my phone, in my to TV. And so, of yeah. course, okay, yeah, I get it. Whereas right. in the 80s or something, it's like... But if it's user-friendly enough, you know, grandpa's on Prime, man. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. One-click yeah. shopping, yeah. Yeah. yeah.